Goethe's Theory of Knowledge. We pointed to the fact that Goethe's scientific worldview was never formulated as a complete whole or developed out of a single principle. We have before us only individual manifestations that show how this or that thought appears in the light of his way of thinking. This is true of his scientific works and of the brief indications he gives about one concept or another in his verses in prose and in letters to his friends. The artistic formulation of his worldview, finally, can be found in his poetic works, which also offer the most diverse clues to his basic ideas. But in admitting without reservation that Goethe never expressed his basic principles as a coherent whole, we in no way intend to validate the claim that his worldview fails to spring from an ideal center that can be formulated in a rigorously scientific way. Let us be clear about the matter before us. What worked in Goethe's spirit as the inner driving principle in all his creations, permeating and enlivening them, could not be manifested as such. Because it permeated all of his works, it could not, at the same time, appear in his consciousness as a separate entity. If this had been the case, then it would have had to appear before his mind as something complete and at rest instead of being actively at work, as it actually always was. The task of Goethe's interpreter is to follow the diverse activities and manifestations of this principle in their constant flow in order to then sketch its ideal contours as a coherent whole. We will only see Goethe's exoteric works in their true light when we succeed in a clear and precise formulation of the scientific meaning of this principle and develop its various aspects with scientific consistency because we will then be able to view them as they evolve out of a common center. Footnote. Steiner is applying Goethe's method to Goethe's own works. Compare my discussion of Goethe's genetic method in section 5. Um, I won't be reading that article by the editor, John Barnes, so you will need to buy this book, I'm afraid. Sorry. End of footnote. This chapter will deal with Goethe's theory of knowledge, his epistemology. Before we consider Goethe's relationship to this science, we must briefly touch on a certain confusion regarding its task that has unfortunately persisted since Kant. Kant believed that philosophy before him had strayed by seeking to know the essential nature of things without first asking how such knowledge is possible in the first place. He saw the fundamental malady of all philosophizing that preceded him in the fact that thinkers thought about the nature of an object before examining our human cognitive capacities. He therefore proceeded to examine this fundamental philosophical problem, thereby inaugurating a new trend in thought. Philosophy based on Kant has since focused untold cognitive power on this question, and in philosophical circles today an approach to its solution is sought more than ever. As a result, however, epistemology, which has become the central scientific question of the day, is assumed to be no more than a comprehensive answer to the question, how is knowledge possible? Applied to Goethe, the question would then be, how did Goethe conceive of the possibility of knowledge? On closer examination, however, we find that the answer to this question cannot possibly be the starting point for a theory of knowledge. For if I ask how something is possible, then I must have already examined the nature of the thing itself. But what if the concept of knowledge held by Kant and his followers about which they ask whether it is possible or not, proved to be wholly untenable. What if it could not withstand penetrating criticism? What if our cognitive process were something quite different from Kant's definition of it? His whole work in this field would then be worthless. Kant simply took for granted the commonly accepted concept of knowing 
and then inquired into its possibility. According to this concept, knowing is the depiction of a reality that exists in itself, outside our consciousness. We cannot, however, determine the possibility of knowing before we have found out what knowing is. Thus the question, what is knowing, becomes the primary concern for any theory of knowledge. It will therefore be our task to show how Goethe conceived of knowing. Footnote, this question, what is the nature of knowing or cognition, is probably most directly dealt with by Rudolf Steiner in his title Intuitive Thinking as a Spiritual Path, a Philosophy of Freedom, previously translated as the Philosophy of Spiritual Activity. Edit editor and a footnote. The formation of a particular judgment or the recognition of a fact or series of facts, something that for Kant we can already call knowledge, is not yet knowing in Goethe's sense. Otherwise he would not have said that style, as the highest form of art, rests upon the deepest foundations of knowledge and thereby distinguishes itself from the simple imitation of nature, wherein the artist turns to natural objects faithfully and diligently imitates their forms and colors with the utmost exactness and conscientiously avoids ever distancing himself from them. This distancing oneself from the sense world in its immediacy is characteristic of Goethe's view of genuine knowing. What is immediately given is experience. In our knowing, however, we create a picture of the immediately given, which contains significantly more than what the senses, the mediators of all experience, can provide. In order to grasp nature in the Goethean sense, we must not hold on to it in its immediate factuality. Rather, nature must reveal itself through the process of cognition as something essentially higher than what appears at first sight. The school of John Stuart Mill assumes that all we can do with experience is simply to categorize various things into groups and then retain them as abstract concepts. Footnote, John Stuart Mill, 1806 to 1873, English empiricist philosopher and social thinker. Editor, end of footnote. This, however, is not true knowing. For Mill's abstract concepts merely summarize what presents itself to the senses with all the qualities of immediate experience. True knowing must acknowledge that the immediate form of the given sense-perceptible world is not yet its essential form, which reveals itself to us only in the process of knowing. Knowing must provide us with what sense experience withholds, but which is nevertheless real. Mill's knowing is not true knowing because it is only an elaborated experience of the senses that allows things to remain as our eyes and ears convey them to us. It is not that we should go beyond the realm of experience and lose ourselves in a world of fantasy, as the metaphysicians of earlier and more recent times loved to do. Rather, we should progress from experience as given to the senses to a form of experience that satisfies our reason. A new question now arises. What is the relationship between unmediated experience and the picture of experience that arises in the process of knowing? We will first answer this question independently and then show that our answer also follows from Goethe's worldview. Initially, the world presents itself to us as a multiplicity in space and time. We perceive particulars separated in space and time. This color here, that form there, now this tone, now that noise, 
and so on. Let us first take an example from the inorganic world and distinguish with great precision between what we perceive with our senses and what arises through the cognitive process. We see a stone flying toward a pane of glass, breaking through it, and finally falling to the ground. We ask, what is given here as immediate experience? A sequence of visual perceptions proceeding from the places successively occupied by the stone, a series of sound perceptions as the pain shatters, the flying of glass fragments, and so on. Unless we want to deceive ourselves, we will have to say that nothing further is presented to our immediate experience than this incoherent aggregate of perceptions. The same rigorous delimitation of the immediately perceptible of sense experience can also be found in Fulkelt's excellent treatise on Kant's theory of knowledge, which is among the best that modern philosophy has produced. Footnote, Johannes Emanuel Fulkelt, 1848 to 1939, title, I'll give it a chat, Kant's Erkenntnistheorie, ihren Grundprinzipien nach analysiert, Kant's theory of knowledge, analyzed according to its basic principles, Hamburg, 1879, editor, end of footnote. But it is impossible to see why Fulkelt regards discrete perceptual images as mental pictures and thereby precludes the possibility of objective knowledge from the very start. Footnote, the term mental picture is used by Steiner for what emerges from the process of cognition as the synthesis of percept and concept. Editor, end of footnote. Let me read that sentence uh, again. But it is impossible to see why Fulkelt regards discrete perceptual images as mental pictures and thereby precludes the possibility of objective knowledge from the very start. It is definitely a preconception to regard immediate experience as a totality of mental pictures. If I have some object before me, I see its form, and color, I perceive a certain hardness, and so on. I do not know, initially, whether this aggregate of images given to my senses is something external to me, or whether it is a mere inner representation. Just as little as I know at first, without thoughtful consideration, that the warmth of a stone is the result of the warming rays of the sun, just as little do I know what the relationship is between the world given to me and my capacity to form mental images. Fulkelt places at the beginning of his epistemology the proposition, quote, that we have a multiplicity of mental pictures of various kinds, close quote. That a multiplicity is given to us is correct, but how do we know that this multiplicity consists of mental pictures? Indeed, Fulkelt does something quite inadmissible when he first asserts that we must ascertain what is given to us by immediate experience and then presupposes something that cannot be a given, that the world of experience is a world of mental pictures. The moment we make such a presumption, we are forced to ask the epistemologically incorrect question characterized above. If our perceptions are mental images, then all our knowledge is of mental images. And the question arises, how is it possible for a mental image to coincide with the object it is supposed to represent? But does any real science ever deal with this question? Consider mathematics. Given a figure formed by the intersection of three straight lines, a triangle, the three angles alpha, beta, and gamma maintain a constant relationship. Together they make a straight angle or two right angles. This is a mathematical statement. What is perceived are the angles alpha, beta, and gamma. The above cognitive judgment is reached on the basis of thoughtful consideration. This judgment establishes a relationship between three perceptual images. 
There was no question of reflecting about any object behind the mental picture of the triangle. Footnote. Rudolf Steiner implies here that our mental picture of the triangle already includes our perceptions of the angles, and that we therefore feel no need to ask about a thing in itself beyond what we have apprehended as a mental picture. Editor, end of footnote. So it is with all sciences. They spin threads from one mental image to another, creating order in what, from the point of view of immediate perception, is chaos. But nowhere does anything besides the given come into consideration. Truth is not the agreement of a mental picture with its object, but rather the expression of a relationship between two or more perceived facts. Let us return to our example of the stone and the window pane. We connect the visual percepts that proceed from the individual places through which the stone moves. This connection gives us a curved line, the trajectory. We obtain the laws of the trajectory. Going further, we perceive the material qualities of glass, then apprehend the stone as cause, the shattering of the pain as effect, and so on. We have so permeated the given with concepts that we come to understand it. All of this work which pulls together the multiplicity of perceptions into a conceptual unity occurs within our consciousness. The ideal interrelationship of the perceptual images is not given through the senses, but is rather simply grasped independently by our mind. For a being endowed only with faculties of sense perception, this entire process would simply not occur. For such a being, the outer world would remain the unstructured perceptual chaos that we have characterized as what first immediately confronts us. Thus the place where the perceptual images appear in their ideal interrelationship where the latter is held up to the former as their conceptual counterpart is human consciousness. The fact that this conceptual, lawful interrelationship in its substantial aspect is produced in our consciousness does not mean that it is subjective with respect to its significance. On the contrary, its meaning or content arises from the objective world, just as certainly as its conceptual form arises from our consciousness. It is the necessary objective complement to the perceptual image. It is precisely because the perceptions of our senses are incomplete, unfinished in themselves, that we are compelled to add this necessary complement. If the immediately given were satisfying in itself and did not present us with problems at every point, we would never need to go beyond it. But the perceptual images do not by any means follow and arise out of one another in such a way that we can see them as resulting from one another. They result rather from something else that is inaccessible to the perception of the senses. Conceptual apprehension comes to meet them and grasps the aspect of reality that remains hidden to the senses. If sense experience provided us with something complete in itself, the process of knowing would indeed be useless. No combining, ordering, or grouping of sense-perceptible facts would have any objective value whatsoever. The activity of knowing is only meaningful if we do not regard the configuration given to the senses as complete, if we regard it as only half of a totality, bearing within itself something of a higher order still, something, though, that is no longer immediately perceptible to the senses. Now the human spirit becomes active. 
It perceives that higher element. Thinking should therefore not be conceived of as adding something to the essence of reality. It is no more and no less an organ of perception than the eye or ear. Just as the eye perceives colors and the ear hears sound, thus thinking perceives ideas. Idealism is therefore perfectly compatible with the principle of empirical research. Ideas are not the contents of subjective thinking, but the results of research. Reality comes to meet us when we approach it with open senses. It presents itself to us in a guise that we cannot regard as its true form. We can attain the latter only when we set our thinking in motion. Knowing means adding to the half-reality of sense experience what we perceive through thinking, so that our picture of reality becomes complete. Everything depends on how we conceive of the relationship between ideas and sense-perceptible reality. By the latter I mean the totality of perceptions conveyed to us by our senses. Now the most widely held view is that concepts are merely a means for our consciousness to appropriate the data of external reality. The essence of reality is thought to lie only in the things themselves, so that if we were actually able to reach their primal nature, we would still be left with only its conceptual representation and by no means this essence itself. This view, therefore, assumes the existence of two completely separate worlds, the objective outer world which bears its essential nature, the foundations of its existence within itself, and the subjective ideal inner world which is thought to be a conceptual copy of the outer world. This inner world is a matter of complete indifference to the objective world. It is not called for by the latter. It exists only for the cognizing human being. <clears throat> the epistemological ideal of this basic view would be to achieve the congruence of these two worlds. I include among its adherents not only the scientific mainstream of our time, but also the philosophy of Kant, Schopenhauer, and the Neo-Kantians, and equally the final phase of Schelling's philosophy. These schools of thought all agree in that they seek the essence of the world in a trans-subjective realm, and in that they have to admit from their perspective that the subjective ideal world which for them is therefore a world of mere mental representations, has no meaning for reality itself, but only and exclusively for human consciousness. As I have already indicated, this view leads to the assumption of a perfect correspondence between concept, idea, and percept. What is found in the percept would have to be replicated in its conceptual counterpart only an ideal form. With respect to their essence, both worlds would have to coincide completely. The conditions of space-time reality would have to repeat themselves exactly in the idea, except that instead of the perceived spatial extension, shape, color, and so on, the corresponding mental pictures would have to be present. If, for example, I saw a triangle, I would have to follow its contours, size, the inclination of its sides, and so on, in my thoughts, and create a conceptual photograph of it for myself. When confronted with a second triangle, I would have to do exactly the same thing. And so, likewise, with every object of the external and internal sense world. Thus, in my ideal picture of the world, each object would be found again with its exact location and characteristics. We now ask, do the consequences of this widely held view correspond with the facts? Not at all. 
my single concept of the triangle encompasses all individual perceived triangles. No matter how often I bring it to consciousness, it always remains the same. My various mental pictures of the triangle are all identical. Footnote. The careful reader will not be able to accept this statement. Steiner himself clearly contradicts it in his reference to Barclay in the second following paragraph. Our mental picture, Vorstellung, of an equilateral triangle is not identical with that of a right triangle, for example. Steiner does not distinguish here between concepts and mental pictures. In his title, Intuitive Thinking as a Spiritual Path, where he deals more thoroughly with the theory of knowledge, he makes this distinction clear. In Chapter 6, Human Individuality, he writes, quote, A mental picture is nothing but an intuition related to a specific percept. It is a concept once linked to a percept, for which the relation to that percept has remained. Thus a mental picture stands between a percept and a concept. A mental picture is the specific concept that points to a percept. Close quote from pages 99 to 100, uh, editor and a footnote. I have only one concept of the triangle. In reality, every single thing presents itself as a particular, fully defined, in quotes, this, in contrast to equally well defined and thoroughly real, quote, in quotes, those. The concept, which is strictly a unity, comes to meet this multiplicity. In it there are no particulars, no parts, it does not proliferate. No matter how often it is pictured, it is always the same. The question now arises, what is the actual source of the identity of the concept? It certainly cannot be its manifestation as mental picture, for Berkeley was completely justified in maintaining that my present mental picture of a tree has nothing whatsoever to do with the mental picture I will have of it a minute later, if I close my eyes in the meantime, and that, if several individuals form mental pictures of the same object, there will, these will have just as little to do with one another. The identity can therefore lie only in the meaning of the mental images. It is their meaning or essential content, the conceptual aspect, that attests to their identity. Thus, the view that denies all independent meaning to the concept or idea collapses. This view contends specifically that the conceptual unity, as such, is altogether without its own content that it arises only through the omission of certain particulars in the objects of experience. The common elements, however, are emphasized and incorporated into our intellect so as to achieve a convenient grasp of the multiplicity of objective reality by embracing it with the fewest possible general terms, that is, according to the principle of the least expenditure of energy. Schopenhauer shares this point of view with the philosophy of modern science. It is represented in its most crass and therefore most one-sided consequences in Richard Avenarius' little pa pamphlet uh, titled Philosophy as Thinking About the World According to the Principle of the Least Expenditure of Energy, an introduction to a critique of pure experience. Footnote, the German of that is the title Die Philosophie als Denken der Welt gemäß dem Prinzip des kleinsten Kraftmaßes Prolegomena zu einer Kritik der reinen Erfahrung. Leipzig, 1876, editor and a footnote. This view, however, rests entirely upon a total misconstruing, not only of the content of the concept, but also of the percept. To clarify this matter, let us go back to the fundamental insight that places the percept in its particularity over and against the concept in its universality. We must ask ourselves, what actually distinguishes the particular? Can we define it conceptually? 
Can we say that a conceptual unity can be broken down into such and such particular perceptual multiplicities? Certainly not. The concept itself has nothing to do with the particularity. This particularity, therefore, must consist of elements that are inaccessible to the concept as such. Since we know of no intermediary between percept and concept, these elements of the particular must belong to the percept itself, unless we wish to introduce something like Kant's fantastic mystical schemata, which can hardly be taken seriously today. Footnote, Rudolf Steiner does not introduce the mental picture here as an intermediary between concept and percept as he does in his later work editor and a footnote. The reason for their particularity cannot be derived from the concept, but must be sought in the percept itself. What constitutes the particularity of an object cannot be grasped conceptually, but only perceived. Therein lies the reason for the inevitable shipwreck of every philosophy that attempts to derive the whole of perceived reality from the concept itself. Here also lies the classic error of Fichte, who wanted to derive the whole world from human consciousness. Anyone who dismisses idealist, idealist philosophy out of hand for its inability to perform the impossible is indeed just as unreasonable as the philosopher W. T. Krug, a successor to Kant, who demanded that the philosophy of identity deduce for him a pen with which to write. What actually distinguishes the percept from the concept is essentially just this element that cannot be conceptualized, but must simply be experienced. Thus concept and percept stand juxtaposed as two different aspects of the world that are nevertheless identical in their essential nature. And because, as we have shown, the percept calls for the concept, it follows that its essence lies not in its particularity, but in its conceptual universality. With regard to its appearance, however, this universality must first be found in the subject. For while it cannot be derived from the object, it can indeed be found by the subject as the latter investigates the object. The concept cannot draw its content from sense experience, for it does not take up into itself precisely what is characteristic of experience, its particularity. Everything particular is foreign to the concept. The concept must, therefore, provide its own content. It is commonly said that the object of experience is individual vivid perception, whereas the concept is abstract and compared to the content-filled percept, poor, paltry, empty. The richness of these differentiated sensory particulars is sought in their number, which, because of the infinitude of space, can be infinitely great. But the concept is not, therefore, less fully defined, for here number is replaced by qualities. And just as quantities are not to be found in the concept, the percept lacks dynamic qualitative character. Footnote, the dynamic qualitative aspect of the concept arises through our inner participation. When this occurs, the concept loses its abstractness and is permeated with life and character. End of footnote. The concept is just as individual as the percept its content just as rich. The only difference is that to grasp the essence of the percept, nothing is required but open senses, a purely passive relationship to the external world. Whereas the ideal significance of the world must arise through our own spontaneous spiritual activity if it is to appear at all. To say that the concept is the enemy of living perception is a thoughtless cliché. The concept is the essential being of the percept, its actual driving and active principle. It 
adds its own content to that of the percept without eliminating the latter, for it is not concerned with the perceptual content as such, and yet it is supposed to be the enemy of perception. The concept could become the enemy of perception only if a misguided philosophy wished to spin the entire wealth of the sensory world out of the idea. Such a philosophy would produce, instead of living nature, only a system of empty phrases. Only in the way indicated here do we come to a satisfactory explanation of what actually constitutes knowledge based on experience. It would be impossible to explain why it is necessary to advance to a conceptual understanding unless the concept were to bring something new to the perception of our senses. Purely empirical knowledge could not take a single step beyond the millions of particulars placed before our perception. To be consistent, purely empirical knowledge would have to deny its own content. For why should we recreate conceptually what is already present in our percepts? In the light of these considerations, a consistent positivism would simply have to cease all scientific work and rely solely upon random occurrences. Footnote. In this sense, statistics and probability have come closest to consistent positivism. Close. Editor. End of footnote. Insofar as it does not do this, it actually carries out what it rejects in theory. In fact, both materialism and realism implicitly admit what we maintain. Their actual practice is justified only from our point of view and stands in glaring contradiction to their own fundamental theories. From our standpoint, the necessity of scientific knowledge and the need to go beyond sense experience can be explained without any contradiction. The sensory world appears to us as initially and directly given. It faces us like an immense riddle because we are simply unable to find within this world itself what drives, shapes, or animates it. Now reason enters. And with the ideal world that it conceives holds up to the sensory world the governing principles that constitute the solution to the riddle. These principles are just as objective as the sensory world itself. The fact that they do not appear to the senses but only to reason has no bearing on their content. If there were no thinking beings, these principles would never appear. But this would in no way detract from the fact that they are the essence of the phenomenal world. Over and against the transcendental worldview of Locke, Kant, the later Schelling, Schopenhauer, Volkelt, the Neo-Kantians and modern scientists, we thus put forward a worldview that is truly immanent whereas they seek the primary principles of reality in a realm beyond our consciousness and foreign to it, immanent philosophy seeks those principles in what appears to reason. The transcendental worldview regards conceptual knowledge as a picture of the world. The immanent view sees it as the highest form of mani as the world's highest form of manifestation. All the former can produce is a formal theory of knowledge based on the question, what is the relationship between thinking and actual being? The latter places at the beginning of its epistemology the question, what is knowing? The former proceeds from the preconception that there is an essential difference between thinking and being. The latter enters without preconception into an investigation of what alone can give us certainty of thinking and it knows that outside of thinking it can find no being. Summarizing the results of our epistemological reflections, we arrive at the following. 
we must proceed from the totally indeterminate, immediate form of reality as given to our senses, from what is only seen, only heard, and so on, before we set our thinking in motion. The point is that we distinguish between what the senses convey to us and what our thinking brings to it. The senses do not tell us that there are any particular relationships between things. For example, that this is the cause and that the effect. For the senses, all things have equal importance for the structure of the world. Thoughtless observation does not indicate that a seed is at a higher level of complexity than a grain of dust on the road. As far as the senses are concerned, if they look alike, they are both of equal significance. At this level of observation, Napoleon is no more important to world history than a peasant in some backwater village. This is as far as present-day epistemology has progressed, that these truths have by no means been thought through exhaustively is demonstrated by the fact that virtually every epistemologist makes the mistake of immediately designating as mental picture what confronts us on the first level of perception as initially undefined and indeterminate appearance. This, however, is nothing but a gross violation of the very insight we have just gained. As long as we remain at the level of pure sense perception, we know just as little about a falling stone being a mental picture as we know about its being the cause of the depression in the ground where it falls. We can arrive at this latter judgment only through thoughtful consideration, and only through reflection could we arrive at the insight that the world given to us is a mere mental picture, assuming this is true. My senses give me no clue as to whether what they convey is an actual being or merely a mental picture. The sensory world bursts in upon us instantaneously as though fired from a pistol. If we want it in its purity, we must refrain from attaching to it any qualifying attributes. We can only say one thing, that it confronts us, it is given to us. This says nothing at all about this sensory world itself. Only by proceeding in this manner can we avoid interfering with an unbiased assessment of what is given. This freedom from prejudice is lost if, from the very start, we attach a particular characterization to what is given. If, for example, we say that the given is a mental picture, then our entire inquiry will be based on this presupposition. We would not thereby be providing an unbiased theory of knowledge, but would rather be answering the question, what is knowing, under the presupposition that what is given to the senses is a mental picture. This is the fundamental error of Folkelt's epistemology. At the beginning he establishes the rigorous requirement that all theory of knowledge be free from presupposition, but he then goes on to assert that we have a multiplicity of mental pictures. Thus his theory of knowledge is only an answer to the question, how is knowing possible if we assume that the given is a multiplicity of mental pictures? Our approach is quite different. We take the given as is as a multiplicity of something or other which will, re which will reveal itself to us if we allow ourselves to be carried along by it. By allowing the object itself to speak, we thus have the prospect of gaining objective knowledge. We can hope that the phenomenon that presents itself to us will reveal everything we need providing we do not allow some obstructive prejudice to block the free access of its proclamations to our power of judgment. <clears throat> For even if reality should forever remain a riddle to us, knowing such a truth would have value only if it were gained by reference to actual things. 
it would be totally meaningless. On the other hand, to maintain that our consciousness is constituted in such a way that we are unable to reach any clarity regarding the things of the world. Whether our spiritual capacities are adequate to grasp the nature of things, this we must test, this we must test ourselves in connection with these things themselves. I may possess the most perfect mental capacities, but if things reveal nothing about themselves, my gifts are useless. And conversely, even if I know that my powers are slight, this in itself does not yet tell me that they are not, nevertheless, sufficient to know things. We have also come to see that what is immediately given in the form characterized above leaves us unsatisfied. It presents a challenge, a riddle that needs to be solved. It says to us, I am here, but I do not appear to you in my true form. As we hear this voice from without, with growing awareness that we are facing a half-reality, an entity whose better side remains concealed from us, there announces itself from within us the activity of the organ through which we attain knowledge of the other side of reality, through which we are able to complement the given half and thus create a whole. We realize that what we do not see here and so on must be supplemented through our thinking. Our thinking is called upon to solve the riddle presented by perception. We will only understand this relationship when we investigate why we are dissatisfied with perceptible reality, yet satisfied with the reality attainable through thinking. Sensory reality confronts us as something finished. It is simply there. We have contributed nothing to its being as it is. We therefore feel ourselves confronted with something foreign that we have not produced. Indeed, we are not even present at its production. We stand before an already existing entity. Yet in order to fully comprehend something, we need to know how it came to be what it is, to follow the steps leading to the thing before us. This is different with our thinking. A thought configuration does not present itself to me unless I myself participate in its coming about. It enters the field of my perception only when I myself raise it out of the dark abyss of imperceptibility. A thought does not appear within me as a finished entity, as does a sense perception. On the contrary, when I hold it fast as a finished configuration, I am conscious of the fact that I myself have brought it into this form. What lies before me appears to me not as a foreign entity, but as the completion of a process so intimately bound up with me that I have always stood inside it. This is precisely what I must accomplish with whatever appears on the horizon of my perception if I am to understand it. Nothing should remain obscure to me. Nothing should confront me as already finished. I myself must follow it to its completion. This is why the immediate form of reality we usually call experience induces us to work it through scientifically. When we bring our thinking into movement, we uncover the initially hidden factors that determine the given. We raise ourselves from the product to its production. We arrive at the stage where the sense perceptible becomes transparent to us in the same way that thought is transparent. Thus our inner need for knowledge is satisfied. Our scientific understanding of something is complete only when our thinking has fully and thoroughly penetrated the sense perceptible. A world process appears completely penetrated by us only when this process is our own activity. A thought appears as the conclusion of a process within which we stand. The only process into which we can fully place ourselves, completely immerse ourselves, is thinking. 
For scientific observation, experienced reality must appear as arising out of a developing thought process in the same way that a pure thought itself does. To explore a thing's essential nature means to proceed from the center of our thought world and to work our way outward until there arises before our soul a thought configuration that appears to be identical with our outer experience. When we speak about the essential nature of a thing or of the world, we can therefore mean nothing other than apprehending its reality as thought, as idea. In the idea we come to know that from which we must derive everything else, the principle of things. What philosophers call the absolute, the eternal being, the foundations of the world, what the religions call God, this we call, based on the theory of knowledge presented here, the idea. Everything in the world that does not directly appear as idea will eventually be recognized as proceeding from it. What seems to superficial consideration, to have nothing to do with the idea, is derived from it by a deeper thinking. No other form of existence can satisfy us except what is derived from the idea. Nothing should remain isolated outside it. Everything must become part of the greater whole encompassed by the idea. The idea, however, requires no going beyond itself. It is the essential being, built upon and firmly founded in itself. The reason for this does not lie in the fact that the idea is immediately present in our consciousness. It lies in the idea itself. If the idea did not express its own being, it would seem to us in need of explanation, just like the rest of reality. This seems to contradict what was said above, that the idea appears in a form that satisfies us because we actively participate in its coming into existence. But this does not stem from the organization of our consciousness. If the idea were not built upon its own foundations, we could have no such consciousness of satisfaction at all. If something does not have within itself the center from which it springs, but has its center outside itself, then when it presents itself to me, I cannot declare myself satisfied with it. I must go beyond it to find that center. Only when I come upon something that does not point beyond itself do I attain the consciousness, now you are standing inside the center, here you can remain. My consciousness that I am standing inside a thing is only the result of its objective nature, of the fact that it contains its own principle. By taking possession of the idea, we gain entry into the center of the world. What we grasp here is the source from which everything springs. We become one with this principle. Therefore the idea, what is most objective, appears to us at the same time as most subjective. Sense perceptible reality is in fact such a riddle to us for the very reason that we do not find its center within it. It ceases to be so enigmatic when we realize that it has the same center as the thought world which comes to manifestation within us. Such a center must be a unified one. Indeed, it must be of such a kind that all other things point to it as to their source of explanation. If there were several centers to the world, several principles to which it could be known, and if one area of reality pointed to this world principle, another area to that one, then as soon as we found ourselves in one such area, we would be directed to its center only. It would not occur to us to inquire about still other centers. One area would know nothing about the other. They would simply not exist for one another. 
Therefore, it makes no sense at all to speak of more than one world. The fact that there are different kinds of consciousness and that each has its own image of the idea does not at all change the fact that the idea is one and the same every, anywhere in the world and in any type of consciousness. The idea content of the world is based on its own foundations. It is complete and perfect within itself. We do not create it. We only seek to comprehend it. Our thinking does not create it. It perceives it. Thinking is not a producer, but an organ of apprehension. Just as various eyes all see the same object, various kinds of consciousness think the same thought content. They think the same thing, but they approach it from different sides. It therefore appears to them in various modifications. These modifications, however, do not stem from a difference in objects, but rather from different angles of vision. Differences in human views are just as explicable as the differences in the way a landscape presents itself to two observers standing in different places. If we are at all capable of penetrating to the world of ideas, we can be sure that in the end this world is common to everyone. It can, of course, still be the case that we see it in a very one-sided way. For example, from our point of view it may appear in a most unfavorable light, and so on. We are probably never faced with a sensory world completely devoid of thought content. We perhaps come closest to pure sense perception in earliest childhood, when there is as yet no trace of thinking. Our ordinary life experience is halfway permeated by thinking. It already appears more or less lifted out of the obscurity of perception into the clear light of spiritual comprehension. The sciences work toward the goal of fully overcoming this obscurity and leaving nothing in experience that has not been permeated with thought. Now, what has the theory of knowledge achieved for the other sciences? It has clarified the purpose and task of all science. It has shown us the significance of every particular science. Our theory of knowledge is the science that determines the nature and task of all the other sciences. It has made it clear that what the individual sciences attain is the objective foundation of world existence. The sciences arrive at certain concepts. Epistemology throws light on the actual task of these concepts. Through this characteristic result, our theory of knowledge, formulated in accordance with Goethe's way of thinking, diverges from all other epistemologies of the present. It does not wish merely to establish a formal relationship between thinking and being. It does not wish to solve the epistemological problem through logic only. It wants to, be, to come to a positive result. It shows that the content of our thinking is, excuse me, it shows what the content of our thinking is, and it finds that it is at the same time the objective world content. <clears throat> this makes epistemology the most significant science for the human being. It clarifies our role as human beings, and shows us how we stand in relation to the world. It thus becomes for us a source of satisfaction. It shows us our true calling. When in possession of its truths we feel ourselves uplifted, our scientific research appears in a new light. Only now do we know that we are connected with the innermost core of world existence in the most immediate way, that this core which remains concealed to all of the beings is uncovered by us, that the world spirit manifests in us that it dwells in us. We see that the world process is brought to completion within us. We see that we are called upon to accomplish what the other powers of the world are incapable of achieving, and that this achievement is the crowning of creation. If religion teaches that God created human beings in his own image, our theory of knowledge teaches us 
that God took creation only to a certain point. It was at this point that he brought the human being into existence. And as we come to know ourselves and to look about us, we set ourselves the task of carrying the work forward, of bringing to completion what the primal power began. We immerse ourselves in the world and realize what can be built upon the foundations that have been laid. We learn to see the intentions of the primal spirit and carry them out. In this way, the theory of knowledge is also the science of the significance and vocation of humanity, and it resolves this question, parenthesis, of the, quote, vocation of humanity, close quote, close parenthesis, in a much more definite way than Fichte did at the turn of the 18th into the 19th century. In no way can we gain from the book of that powerful mind the same full satisfaction that can be derived from a genuine theory of knowledge. It is, a, it is our task to work upon individual existence so that it appears to proceed from the idea, so that its particularity is fully sublimated and merges with the idea into whose element we feel ourselves transported. Our spirit has the task of forming itself in such a way that it acquires the ability to see through all given external reality so that this reality appears to proceed from the idea. We must endeavor to become tireless workers in transforming every object of our experience until it presents itself as a part of our ideal world picture. We have now arrived at the point where Goethe's way of viewing the world takes its start. Let us apply what has been said in such a way that we can imagine the relationship between idea and external reality presented here as actual deed in Goethe's research. Goethe penetrated to the heart of things in the way that has been justified here. He himself saw his inner way of working as a living heuristic capacity that acknowledging an unknown rule, the idea, of which he has a presentiment, seeks to introduce it into the external world, parenthesis, a title, verses in prose, close parenthesis. When Goethe admonishes us to educate our organs, he can also only mean that we should not simply surrender to what our senses convey, but direct our senses so that they show us things in the right light. Footnote, quote, animals are educated by their organs. Human beings educate theirs and master them, close quote from verses in prose.